Uh, in this video, I'm going to go through the OCR um, A level chemistry paper. This is um, paper three um, from 2020. Uh, and this is the second half of the paper. I did the first half in an earlier video. Okay, so the first question is about thermodynamics. Okay, um, they give the relationship between Kp and absolute temperature. They give it you uh, here, this equation here. Okay, uh, and then they show you how the, the, the value of Kp changes at different temperatures uh, for an equilibrium. And you've got to complete the table by missing the, uh, the values of uh, one over T. Uh, which is, uh, I've done them there. So you just have to do, so there are all the values in red. So um, this one, one over 500, two times 10 to the minus three, completed all of those. And then you have to work out the value of LUN KP. So they give you the value of KP uh, in this, this uh, line here. And you just use the LUN button on, button on your calculator. Uh, I've given to three significant figures here. So in blue, those values there. So you get two marks for just for filling in that table. Okay, now you can probably see where this, where this question is going. Now you're gonna to have to plot some kind of a graph, okay? All right, but let's just do B first of all. State and explain how increasing the temperature affects the position of this equilibrium and whether the forward reaction is exo or endothermic. Right, well, we can see here, we have a look here, uh, that as, um, as temperature gets bigger, so you're going from 400 to 800 there, as temperature gets bigger, Kp gets smaller. So temperature increases, Kp gets smaller. Well, if you have the reaction like A going to B, well, Kp for that reaction would be the partial pressure of B over the partial pressure of A. If Kp is getting smaller as the temperature increases, that means that uh, we're getting less B and more A. So increasing the temperature makes the reaction go backwards, the equilibrium position move backwards. So that backward reaction must be endo. So the forward reaction must be exothermic, okay? In short, if you increase the temperature, the equilibrium moves to the left, so the forward reaction must be endothermic. Okay. Now, uh, we'll go to the next bit of this. Okay, so I'm just gonna copy that equation there. Okay, all right, so it says here, uh, right, we've got to plot a graph of LUN KP against 1 over T using the axis provided and use the graph and the equation to determine delta H in kilojoules per mole for this reaction, for this equilibrium, sorry. Um, right, so you probably realise what we're going to do here. I've written down the equation of a straight line there. We have we've somehow we've got to, we've got to linearise that expression they've given us here. So we are going to be plotting uh, LUN KP on the y-axis and we are going to be plotting one over t that's going to be x so you can see here that the gradient of this graph m is going to be minus delta h over r okay and also the intercept is going to be the entropy change divided by r okay Right, so I just sketched that little graph there on the right. So we've got LUN KP here on the y-axis. Uh, we've got 1 over T on the x-axis. Um, this gradient, this graph will have a positive gradient because we worked out before that delta H for the Ford reaction, well, it's exothermic, so delta H is minus. So minus delta H is positive, so we will have a positive gradient. So I've drawn the, the line there. And what we're going to have to work out, um, the gradient of that line, okay, M. M is going to be equal to minus delta H over R. So rearrange that, we're going to write, 
we're going to write down delta H is going to be minus M times R. Right, so we're going to use the values in that table to plot the graph, and I have plotted the graph there. I'll just chop the label off that, so that's ln kp on this axis here. So I've plotted a line of best fit, and we're going to work out the gradient. So here's the change in y, which I've done. Is that there? Okay. So that's going to be 140 minus, 140 minus 40 is equal to 100. And the change in the x, that's on the 1 over t scale. Uh, that's going to be 2.6 times 10 to the minus 3 minus 0.9, which is equal to 1.7 times 10 to the minus 3. So now we're going to have to work out the gradient. And let's not forget that the uh, we just said before, Delta H is equal to minus the gradient multiplied by R, the gas constant. Okay, so let's work out the gradient. M is equal to 100 divided by 1 1.7 times 10 to the minus 3. That is equal to 58,000. 823. Now let's think about, it's important to think about the, the units of that gradient there. What are the units? Well, on the top, the y-axis, we've got Kp, which has got no units. Lun Kp, sorry. You have no units when you take a log of something. And we've got 1 over t, so the units of this x-axis, they're going to be kelvins to the minus 1. Okay. Right, so that means our gradient has got units of 1 over Kelvin to the minus 1. That's equal to Kelvins, isn't it? Right, now let's think about what are the units of R. Well, that's, uh, well, the value is 8.31 joules per mole per Kelvin. So if we work out delta H then, uh, let's work out delta H. The answer you're going to see is going to be in joules. It won't be in kilojoules because we've got joules there. It's going to be joules per mole, sorry, I've missed a minus one off there. So delta H is equal to 5, 8, well, it's minus 5, 8, 8, 2, 3, multiplied by 8.31. That gives us 48,823. Uh, for, sorry, I missed an eight out there. 488,823 uh, minus uh, joules per mole, uh, which is equal to, let's round up to three significant figures, in kilojoules divided by 1,000 minus 489 kilojoules per mole. That's the answer there. Okay. Right, how could you calculate delta S from that, from that graph? Well, we said earlier, didn't we? Let's put in the equation again. Um, our line of best fit, uh, uh, sorry, linear. Well, C there is the intercept on the y-axis, okay? So what you would do is delta, so the intercept on the y-axis, which we can't see because we haven't actually, um, our y-axis isn't going into the right range, but you, if you plot, if you extrapolate it, you get it. The intercept on the y-axis is equal to um, delta S over R. So delta S is equal to the gas constant R multiplied by the intercept. And uh, the units, of course, that's going to be in joules per mole per Kelvin, because that's the units of the gas constant R. And the intercept doesn't have any units because it's a log scale. Okay. Right, so that's the end of that question there. Right, the last question then. Uh, 
two different types of acid found in organic compounds, carboxylic acid and sulfonic acids as shown, okay? So you've got carboxylic acid and a sulfonic acid. Um, table six, complete, uh, to predict the bond angles A and B and name the shapes which makes these bond angles. Okay, so let's do the carboxylic acid first. Well, we think about that carbon, well, there are no lone pairs because we've got one of the carbon's electrons in that bond there. We're gonna have two of the carbon's electrons in the double bond. And the fourth electron for carbon to the oxygen there. Um, so there's no lone pairs to worry about. And double bonds, we think just the same as single bonds. So we've got three bonding pairs. So that means the shape around the carbon is gonna be trigonal planar. And the bond angle is 120 degrees. Okay, now let's do the same for the sulfonic acid, for the oxygen and the sulfonic acid. Right, so it's that. Let's think about oxygen there. Well, oxygen is forming two single bonds. Uh, one to the H, of course, oxygen is in group six. So that means there are two lone pairs to think about. We've got two lone pairs. So we have got four pairs altogether. We've got two bond pairs and two lone pairs. Now, if it was four pairs, the bond angle would be, would be tetrahedral shape, maybe 109.5 degrees, wouldn't it? But because you've got lone pairs, that the, the, the lone pair repulsion is greater. Uh, and there's two lone pairs there. If there's one lone pair, we go down to about 107.5, but two lone pairs, it goes down to about 104.5. It's basically the bond angle you get in water. Uh, so shape, you would say, is V-shaped. The bond angle is 104.5. Okay, uh, ethanoic and methane sulfonic acid are both monobasic acids. pKa values shown in the table. Okay, now we can see from the, the lower the pKa value, the stronger the acid is, okay? So that means that this is by far and away the strongest acid. And the ethanoic acid is weaker. Okay, right. So you've got equal concentrations of them both. And the student suggests that the, the, this one should have a lower pH. It will have a lower pH. Okay, it says write an equation showing acid conjugate base pairs for the equilibrium of the two uh, of this with water and it's okay right okay let's do that then so let's write the equilibrium so we're going to have ch3 so2 oh um that's going to react with water Uh, it's a much uh, it's, it's a much stronger acid than water is, uh, so it's going to protonate the water. So we're going to get uh, that will be that will lose a proton. So that's going to be SO two O minus, and we're going to get H three O plus there. Right, name acid one. So this is acid one, and its conjugate base is there. That's base one. The water here is acting as a base, so that's base two. And H3O, if it goes backwards, that will be acting as an acid. So that's acid two. All right, explain whether the student is correct. Okay. Um, well, should it have a lower pH? Well, I think just a little bit of explanation there. At pKa, well, I'd probably put down H, HA, is he HA? KA, but that is equal to. A minus of H plus uh, divided by HA. So we can see from that equation that uh, the bigger the value of Ka, uh, the higher the concentration 
of H plus. So that means the pH is will be lower for the biggest Ka. And of course, Ka is equal to, sorry, pKa is equal to minus um, log of Ka. So that means uh, the larger Ka is, that will make pKa smaller. So yes, the sulfonic acid is, is the stronger acid because it's got the lower pKa. So you will get a lower pH um, if you've got the same concentrations. Okay. They both form esters here. Sulfonic acid esters can be hydrolyzed by aqueous alkali. And so we've got the equation there. So we form the, the conjugate uh, base of the sulfonic acid and we get methanol. In the three boxes below our curly arrows show the mechanism for this reaction. In the first box, the hydroxide ion acts as a nucleophile. Right, now we can see that we're gonna end up breaking this bond here. Okay, so the OH, to acting as a nucleophile, we will have a partial charge on that sulfur, delta positive, because it's attached to two electronegative oxygens. So the first curly arrow is going to be the lone pair on the hydroxide to the sulfur. Right, when that happens, we can see that this has turned into an, a single bonded oxygen with a negative charge on it. So that means that the pi bond is broken here. We're sort of familiar with that in nucleophilic addition. Yeah. The pi bond breaks and both of the electrons go into the oxygen. So that's the second curly arrow we want there. And then what has happened in this step is we have obviously broken this bond. And we can see that there that the lone that, that here, the double bond has reformed. So how are we going to show the curly arrows for that? Well, we We show a uh, pair of electrons goes to form the pi bond there. And the um, this bond breaks. Both of the electrons between the sulfur and the oxygen go onto the oxygen to give that a negative charge. And we get the product there. Okay. Uh, and then the final. Um, the final step is for the proton to um, transfer from the uh, sulfonic acid onto the methanol. We don't have to show any curly arrows for that though. Right, that is the end of the paper.